welcome. You're watching the 7 o'clock news on CNC3. I'm Ria Rambley. I'm Ryan Beatry. I am Jassi Marik with sports. And I'm Colleen Hussain with your weather. Let's tell you what's making the news tonight. Students of San Juan Secondary nursing injuries after a concrete slab falls on his head in school. Three of the four bandits killed by police yesterday are identified. The hunt is still on for three more suspects. Days after gas prices go up, the taxi driver network considers fare increase. Coming up in sport, FIFA endorses the TTFA's audited financials prepared by AG's Business Solutions, urging members to ratify or risk further funding restrictions. Trinidad and Tobago is bracing for the impact of Invest 91L, a tropical disturbance east of the country, as an adverse weather alert goes into effect at midnight tonight. I'll have the details in tonight's weather forecast. Top of the news, a student of the San Juan North Secondary School is tonight recovering from injuries after he was hit on the head by a piece of falling concrete. The school, which has been identified for urgent repairs, remains closed at this time. But the child's mother is tonight concerned that it could have been much worse. Reporter Chessa Sambrano and cameraman Timothy Shasto bring us the story by Ambika Jagasasing. Yesterday I got a call from the school compound, which is Sawa Secondary North. They said um, that my son was injured, something fell and hit him. So I came immediately to them. When I got there, he was his head was already bandaged up, but it was his school shirt and pants was in blood. Upon arriving at the school on Monday, Natasha Alexander questioned what had happened to her son. One of the officers took me to the area that the well, it's like a slab of concrete that fell from the second floor onto his head and it burst his head. Cut was really, really, really bad. He had to get about six or seven stitches on it. And well, that was just about it. They didn't call an ambulance or anything. I had was to take him to the hospital myself. Despite the extent of the injury, the mother was not notified of the incident right away. He said it was lunch and they had now finished lunch. I was notified like about five to ten minutes after one, like about maybe half an hour to an hour afterwards. The child's mother says he was traumatized from the incident and she was told to keep an eye on him due to the extent of his injuries. He's in a lot of pain right now. His face is swollen. Um, his head is still bandaged up and that's about it. He's just home in pain. They just say in money time because he might get some seizures and because of the impact of the lash to his head. Alexander says she was not aware whether any incidents like this one had occurred at the school before. But when she arrived, there were officials on the compound monitoring the area. The school is right now, it's, it's, it's dismissed. So I think that they, it was a concern and that's why they dismissed the school. And no one is on the floor right now, so probably they're going to attend it. She adds that her son is not comfortable with returning to school at this time, since he was disturbed by what had occurred. But despite it all, she is grateful he is alive. This can only happen to my son, it could have happened to anybody, and it could have been worse than what happened to him yesterday. She states that more time should be taken to check schools to ensure that they are fit to be utilized by students and not pose a hazard. Education Minister Dr. Nian Gatsby Dolly notes that she is aware of the unfortunate situation and the student was receiving medical attention. She also says the ministry will continue to provide support for his recovery. Dr. Gatsby Dolly says the school was identified for extensive repairs in September and work should begin this month. Chester Sambrano, CNC3 News. Three of the four bandits killed in a shootout with police in Mayaro yesterday have been identified. They are Akel George of Barataria, Keyshawn Rojas of Chaguanas, and Odell Prito of Digo Martin. Meanwhile, the search continues for three other suspects who escaped. A report states that police responded to a home invasion at the gated Crystal Park community along Beaumont Road. Police acting on information responded and observed the bandits exit in the yard. Upon seeing the officers, the bandits opened fire on them. Police said that in keeping with its use of firearm force policy, the officers returned fire hitting four bandits multiple times. 
The TNT Taxi Drivers Network is tonight considering an increase in fares. The network says, like all citizens, taxi drivers are also feeling the pinch of increased fuel prices. At a news conference this morning, Network President Adrian Acosta said, many taxi associations are discussing the new fuel prices introduced in the budget last week. Acosta said this was the second increase at the pumps in six months. He said that following an increase in fuel prices in April, taxi drivers kept their fares the same. Just as all citizens of this country, we are feeling the pinch too, right? Um, as you all know, we, we, not, we recently came out of a pandemic where we were um, transporting uh, three passengers at a time where we had to sh um, call a shutdown to tell the government know that we are suffering and we were going over gas money, right? Um, they gave us back our 75% and we were still losing at that point in time. From the time we came out of that pandemic, they came and they, um, they, they, they took away the subsidy from the gas. The network is also calling on the government to deal with the issue of illegal PH taxis. Acosta said the only time the government gets serious is when someone loses their life. He recalled the murders of Andrea Barth and Kathisha Kujo, whose deaths involve PH taxis. They are now becoming very violent, right? We have reports from throughout the country of Trinidad and Tobago that taxi drivers are complaining about PA drivers in and around their taxi stand on a daily basis, right? Um, we have made many complaints to the police on many occasions. We have written a lot of letters concerning it, and I hope, I am having faith that the people in authority are listening to us, and they would not wait until somebody dies to do something about this. Acosta said police officers or traffic wardens positioned at taxi stands would help to crack down on the lawlessness. Welcome back. Finance Minister Colman Bird says that wage negotiations between the Chief Personal Officer and four unions have been referred to the Industrial Court. The Minister made the revelation while speaking in Parliament a short while ago. I want to report that four unions have been referred to the Special Tribunal. Fire, prisons, police, tutor. And the NUGFW has gone through the process because they are not referred to the special tribunal of sending the matter to the industrial court. That is the status at this point in time. Now, meanwhile, Minister Imbert also told health workers how and when they will be paid a special payment, which was announced during the budget. Over 20,000 workers in the public health sector they want to know how they will get it. They will get their money in cash. They will get their money next month. Minister Ember told unions that the option of conciliation at any point outside of the court. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister says he's taking full responsibility for the measures announced in the 2022-2023 budget. Dr. Keith Rowley was speaking in his contribution to the budget debate as he responded to criticism from the opposition and the public. Today I take full responsibility as Prime Minister for what has been produced in this budget as head of that government. I don't have to run from that. So calling my name up and down as the opposition has been doing as if it is some personal um, action on my part. No, no. But I am responsible as the cabinet. The Prime Minister said while the opposition heavily criticized the budget, they did not present any alternatives to the government's fiscal plans. One opposition MP says the finance minister cannot be trusted. Revealing details of a high court ruling against Com Imbert in Parliament today, MP Dr. Rudal Munilal called on Imbert to withdraw and review his budget. But Imbert hit back, saying Munilal was manipulating the truth. Charlene Rampasad has the details. Because if the court of law cannot believe the finance minister, how can the parliament believe the finance minister? How can the population believe him? Reading from a High Court ruling delivered on Tuesday against the Finance Minister, MP Dr. Rudal Munilal says Com Imbut cannot be trusted. Munilal says the ruling came after Imbut was taken to court for intervening in the hiring process of a new chairman for the Board of Inland Revenue. The court ruled that he violated the principles of natural justice, violated principles of the law, acted arbitrarily, illegally, illogically. 
this is a ruling of the court and a finance minister. But in response, the finance minister says Munilal was manipulating the truth. Com Embert is seeking to clear the air on the matter. That as a responsible minister of finance, if I have to make a recommendation with respect to a person who should act as chairman of the board of inland revenue and i am aware and it has been confirmed that a particular candidate is under investigation for tax fraud i think i would have to be out of my mind to recommend that person to be the chairman of the board of inland revenue ember says he intends to appeal the high court decision he also reveals the tax fraud matter has been referred to the office of the director of public prosecutions Charlene Rampasad, CNC3 News. Staying in the parliament, an opposition MP has accused the government of being delusional in the face of worsening crime and challenging economic times. During his budget contribution today, San Juan Barataria MP Saddam Hussein said government's failure to take the necessary steps to tackle the main issues plaguing citizens continues to be a major infraction. Jesse Ramdu tells us more. And I'm quoting from the placard, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Embert, H-Y-M-C. It can only mean Embert, how you manage in the country. It's an acronym with various interpretations. But Barataria San Juan MP Saddam Hussein used it to take a dig at the finance minister when budget debate resumed on Tuesday. During his presentation, Hussein lamented what he called a collapsed economy under the government's watch, and more concerning to the MP, a spiraling crime scourge and failing systems. Yeah, about 440-something murders by now, and only 23 murders were detected. Hussein noted that thousands of ballistics and DNA samples remain outstanding at the Forensic Science Center impeding investigations. He also pointed to an alarming finding two years ago by the SSA with nothing done to address the issue. Several gangs now have in their possession weapons which are automatic. These need to be destroyed as intelligence reveal, as intelligent reports reveal some seized firearms do make it back onto the streets in the hands of criminals. The opposition MP also questioned why there continues to be a delay in the operationalization of the pepper spray legislation, robbing the vulnerable of a fighting chance to protect themselves. Hussein also accused the government of using the courts conveniently, citing a recent matter whereby senior PNM officials benefited after the state failed to make representation. He said while government's budget contained plans for digitization, many basic security features such as cameras and other tools remained either broken or beyond repair. Jesse Ram, the OCNC 3 News. Now, while high prices at supermarkets remain a sore point for consumers, the Trade and Industry Minister is hoping for a silver lining. During today's budget debate in Parliament, Minister Paula Gobi-Skoon noted consecutive reductions reported by the Food and Agriculture Organization's Food Price Index. She said once the pattern is maintained, consumers may no longer be forced to make tough decisions. So there appears to be some slight ease internationally. But we have to note that it, you're not going to see the immediate effect in Trinidad and Tobago. And I've put the caveat there, barring other unforeseen global effects because we are susceptible to all of these international shocks. The minister also noted that while there have been reductions in the importation of certain commodities, this country's food import bill is still high. That's right, Ria Gopi Skoon said while the food import bill stood at $5.1 billion in 2019, it is now a staggering $6.3 billion. Locally and internationally, food prices have significantly risen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing war um, uh, conflict in Ukraine, the high energy prices, extreme weather conditions based on climate change, and it is difficult. And, and we share the pain of those at the low end of the spectrum who are suffering as a result of high, price, high food prices and inflation. She said attaining food security and tackling the climbing food import bill are high on the government's agenda. In tonight's Business Watch, Linda's Bakery has announced the closure of two of its branches. And Rajiv Dipti has been re-elected as president of the Supermarket Association. Yes, Peter Christopher.
Linda's Bakery has announced the permanent closure of its City Gate and Princess Town locations. In a posted social media page, the popular bakery chain confirms the two locations closed for good on Friday. In the post, the company says, this was not an easy decision for us to make and we thank you for your support over the years. Linda's says customers who used to visit City Gate can instead visit its excellent city centre, Queen Street and Park Street branches in Port of Spain, while former Princess Town customers are asked to consider the Marabella, High Street, San Fernando and Gulf City locations. Deborah Kamash has been appointed the Head of Project Covenant Office for Anti Macal Limited. Kamash's appointment took effect on October 1st, 2022. Anti Macal also announced the appointment of Jody Mahon to the position of Head of Change and Transformation, as well as the appointment of Andrew Jeffers as the Head of Strategy and Growth. Both appointments took effect on October 1st as well. The company also announced Ravi Dharamdial will take up the position of Sector Business Development Manager for Beverage on November 1st, 2022. Rajiv Dipti has been re-elected as the president of the Supermarkets Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Dipti was confirmed to start his third term following the association's annual general meeting held last week Wednesday at the Buffet King restaurant at Centerpoint Mall in Chikonas. The membership of the Supermarkets Association voted unanimously to return Dipti to the position for the term 2022-2024. Peter Christopher, CNT3 Business Watch. Life has become unpleasant for eight families of Pleasantville ever since Heritage Petroleum dug a trench across their roadway to prevent villagers from driving on top of an old pipeline. The families of Blitz Village say Heritage Petroleum has put their lives in danger by leaving the trench open. And while they understand the dangers of driving over a buried pipeline, they say digging this trench is surely not the answer. Here's Radhika De Silva and Ivan Tulsi with more. Residents of Blitz Village Extension are calling on Heritage Petroleum to explain why they dug this trench, blocking off eight families two months ago. Heritage Petroleum lines are running adjacent to my home. They came to test their lines, which I understand, right? They tested it. In the process of after testing their lines, they decided to dig a trench in front of the roadway that they access to the other neighbors and them and leave it open. She says these murky waters inside the trench attract snakes, frogs and other vermin. The only thing I don't think we see is a caiman as yet. And she says it's also a health hazard. Right now, my two grandchildren has a serious cough. I have to spray my premises maybe every day, every two days, right? Because we are fested with mosquitoes also. Her neighbor, Avril Lucius, says she has lost her livelihood as she can no longer transport school children using her private van. I feel real upset. It's hurting me a lot because I've been it for months, you know, for months. We have been living with it and we just stay quiet and no addressing to it, you know, whatsoever. And just come and look at it and you just bypass it. We are humans just like everybody else. And this former woodworker says he too is affected. I used to operate a little woodwork shop there. But I'm I not in it too much, so it have other guys who does the, using the, 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 the space, the factory and things, so they have problems in getting in there materials and stuff to continue the, the work on there. So. He wants Heritage Petroleum officials to visit the community. I would like them to address the situation and let us know what is the next step concerning the, the access. CNC3 News reached out to a senior official at Heritage Petroleum who told us that they will investigate the complaints and get back to us. Radhika De Silva, CNC3 News. 
a young couple has taken a gamble on agriculture by stepping out of their comfort zone and into a hydroponic farm. While their journey may have had hurdles, Akash Siu and his wife are able to marry their entrepreneurship lessons with a sustainable business model that can flourish in a competitive market. Here's reporter Jesse Ramdeo with more in tonight's Green Thumb segment. Green harvest cropped up in the last five years when Akash Siu and his wife decided to take one bold step. So we were actually looking to earn another revenue stream to help support our, our standard of living and to actually increase our standard of living. Armed with a master's degree in business, Sue shifted focus away from the corporate sector and towards kale cultivation. We did not sleep for 36 hours from harvest to market to, to, to clean up everything. At the couple's factory road hydroponic farm, Sue described how important it was to take calculated risks in an unknown industry. What we did is we actually did some mystery shopping. We went into the groceries and we, we looked at what was being imported that we could grow locally. That was in 2017. So in 2017, most of the groceries were getting their product from their kale product from the States. He said through networking, they were able to scale up production from 40 packs of kale a week to 250 packs a week, with their kale being found on the shelves of some popular supermarkets. But certain limitations threaten their expansion, much like the problems many other farmers face. One of the major hurdles that we can potentially face in the, in the medium term would be access to property, access to land. And I've faced Pradial Lassany at this property as well. Um, pumps have gone missing, crop has gone missing. Sue is now advising the public that while there are rewards with risks, Due diligence in the agriculture sector is critical for newcomers. Jesse Ramde, OCNC3 News. Kalein Hussein rejoins us on set as we brace for bad weather from midnight tonight. Kalein. That's right, Kalein. And Ryan and I were asking just a bit earlier, how did Invest 91L get its name, thinking it may have been named similarly to the storms and the hurricanes? But yeah, it's very different. So yeah. it, a system out in the Atlantic can be called an Invest once the National Hurricane Centre designates that area as an area of investigation. So mm. that's where the Invest comes from. And then it goes for, from an Invest, if it develops further, into a tropical depression and once it reaches tropical storm status after that that's when it gets a name from the list of names and this year the next name on the list of names will be Julia and then Carl and we have two systems in the Atlantic right now competing for those names so let's go take a look because we have Invest 91L with high chances of development that's the one to our east right here but we have newly formed tropical depression 12 as well which is closer to becoming a tropical storm than Invest 91L but the National Hurricane Center said it's forecast has to be quite short-lived as conditions are not very favorable so it's still a competition for Julia and then the next storm after that will be called Carl but looking closer to home right now we are bracing for the impact of this tropical disturbance that is forecast to begin spreading rain showers and thunderstorms across the country from midnight tonight and continues through the next 24 to 48 hours in fact this adverse weather alert remains in effect until noon on Friday we're already seeing lots of showers to our south and east in fact scattered showers exist all the way up the island chain so looking at the weather forecast for us overnight tonight generally cloudy conditions with isolated scattered showers becoming increasingly ever-present across Trinidad and Tobago minimum low temperatures between 23 and 24 degrees so relatively cool and rainy tonight especially after midnight tonight and then tomorrow it's going to be cloudy cool rainy with showers and thunderstorms interspersed there we'll be seeing peak activities throughout the day tomorrow into the night we won't be seeing an easing of the rain until Thursday afternoon minimum low temperatures tomorrow uh, will be around 
around that 23 to 24 degrees and it won't be warming up any quite warmer up to 27 degrees as our maximum high could get warmer across urbanized areas but tomorrow's a day to walk with the umbrellas and jackets if you work in a cold office now for marine areas seas will become agitated as increased low level winds associated with invest 91l moves across especially north of trinidad and tobago seas will be a moderate over the next 24 hours with waves between 1.5 and 2.5 meters in our open waters in sheltered areas below one meter but choppy in those heavier showers and thunderstorms when you're out at sea tomorrow for those mariners if you see lightning head back to harbor lightning can be dangerous to those both onshore and offshore and looking at the extended forecast when can we see some sunshine it's looking to be on Saturday into Sunday, but we are still looking out for isolated late morning through afternoon showers and thunderstorms across western and northern parts of Trinidad then, so it may not be a great time to head to the beach either. Looking at the temperatures, it's going to be cool through the next three days with all of that cloud cover warming back up into the weekend. Some crime news, a Felicity man has been charged after he was found with five guns in his possession. Police say a man got into an altercation with two men while at a business place in Felicity yesterday morning. He was hit by one of the men while the other fired a shot behind him. He ran to his car and managed to escape. Following a report, officers of the Chagones Criminal Investigations Department arrested a 39-year-old man in connection with the incident. At the location, they allegedly found two Glocks, a Smith & Wesson pistol, one Benelli and one Remington shotgun with several rounds of ammunition. And pharmaceuticals with a street value of almost $5 million have been recovered by customs and excise officials. A brief statement from the division says the medicinal drugs were removed without proper documentation from the Port of Spain area. Acting on a tip-off, customs officials were informed and an immediate investigation was launched. The items were recovered on the same day. During the recovery exercise, two persons were detained and are assisting with the investigations. Global Environmental Facility has developed a project that seeks to reduce chemical waste and encourage more sustainable waste management in smaller islands. The island's Caribbean project was launched today at the Hilton Hotel in Port of Spain. Speaking at the inauguration conference, GEF's Chemicals and Waste Coordinator and Senior Environmental Specialist Anil Sukdeo said they hope to establish pollution-free islands in the Caribbean. Yesterday, we heard from the Solid Waste Management Company of Toronto and Tobago that landfills in Trinidad and by extension in other islands are filled and past their capacity. Islands go is one day eliminate the need for them. Waste Management Specialist at the Ministry of Planning and Development and the United Nations Stockholm Convention President Kima Gardner noted that the Caribbean islands face some of the most serious impacts of environmental change. These are things such as climate change and pollution which require complex solutions. She said the program offers these solutions. The implementation of these proposed activities under the program will demonstrate the much needed movement of science to action, where the effects and impacts of these harmful chemicals are mitigated and managed accordingly. The GEF Islands project directly contributes to all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and has a total funding of 150 million US dollars, of which 31 million is from grant funding. It's time to recap our headlines as we leave you. Students of San Juan Secondary nursing injuries after a concrete slab falls on his head in school. Three of the four bandits killed by police yesterday identified. The hunt is still on for three more suspects. And then for sports, FIFA rubber stamps the TTFA's audited financials for 2020 and 2021, urging members to ratify it or risk further funding restrictions. Trinidad and Tobago goes under an adverse weather alert at midnight tonight as we brace for showers and thunderstorms associated with the tropical disturbance. That brings us to the end of the 7 p.m. news. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ria Rambley. I'm Ryan Bechu. I am Jassy Marie. And I'm Kalani Sain. Have a good night.